everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us here in Durham, and good afternoon to everyone who's watching on our Manchester and Concord campuses too. And by the way, if you, you are tuning in online, I wouldn't blame you for having a second screen on your desk with the Winter Olympics playing in the background. I know many of us have been keenly monitoring the exploits of the five Wildcat alumni representing the United States in the games in South Korea. I'm gonna give you a chance to do that again in just a minute. Have you seen Casey Bellamy, for instance, class of 2009, playing for the women's hockey team? This is her third Olympic since she was selected as an assistant captain. What a great example for our talented student athletes. And in addition to Casey, UNH is being represented by Bobby Butler in men's hockey, Claire Egan in biathlon, Annika Taylor in Nordic skiing, and Noah Grove in sled hockey. We're all rooting for you, and let's hear it once more for our Wildcat Olympians. I think the women are in the gold uh, game tomorrow against Canada, that should be fun. So while these athletes are in the global spotlight, let's also take a moment to thank some unsung heroes on Team UNH. In fact, we wouldn't be able to be here today without them. And I'm talking about our colleagues who shovel and plow our sidewalks and roadways, who keep the heat on, and our dormitories and academic buildings, dish out food to hungry students in our dining halls, and serve around the clock to keep UNH the safest campus in America. Let's give them a round of applause too. So, it's a great day to be a Wildcat. <laughs> Thank you, Brent Bell, wherever you are. Is he here? There he is. Thank you, Brent. That's especially true in 2018. Today, across all key areas, teaching and learning, student success, enrollment, philanthropy, and research, the state of the University of New Hampshire is vibrant and strong. Let's start with our students. They are the heart of everything that we do and the reason that we are all here. Of all the many things we did together this past year to make UNH a better place, a more affordable and accessible place for our students, particularly noteworthy is what we call the Granite Guarantee. I know you've heard of it, but I want everyone in the state not only to know about the Granite Guarantee, to be, but to be proud and inspired by what it means for these students and for the future of New Hampshire. The Granite Guarantee provides free in-state tuition to every first-year New Hampshire student who qualifies for a federal Pell Grant. This fall, 400 of them enrolled through it, and assuming they remain in good standing, they will pay no tuition at all for four years saving each of them more than $60,000. For this year's first year's cohort, the total savings will be roughly $24 million by the time they graduate. Let me say that again, $24 million. And the Granite Guarantee is being offered to each incoming class from here on out. Imagine what that means to them, to their families, and to future generations all across New Hampshire. It's truly remarkable. So if anybody asks, what UNH is doing to be more affordable, you now have a ready answer for them. And I'd like to thank our many donors and our remarkable fundraising and financial aid teams for making the Granite Guarantee possible. Thank you. And in 2018, we can celebrate student success on other fronts too. UNH is among the leaders in public higher education in student retention with 86% of our students returning to UNH after their first year. And our graduation rate is equally impressive. at 78%, 78%, 20 points higher than the average for four-year public institutions. We are seventh in the nation in graduation performance. This is a measure, this is a really interesting measure actually, of our students' actual graduation rates compared with how well they would be predicted to perform if you looked only at their academic performance in high school and their demographics when they enrolled. In other words, our students are among the very best in the entire nation when it comes to exceeding expectations, which probably doesn't surprise anybody in this room. It's a credit to their character 
and to the entire UNH family. Moreover, when our students do graduate, 91% either move immediately into jobs or go on to graduate schools. That too is among the highest rates in the nation. Why, one might ask, do our students perform so well? Well, for me, the clearest and most immediate answer is UNH's faculty and staff. You are an extraordinary and extraordinarily committed group of people. Somehow, despite the time and energy that you put into making UNH a first-class research institution, you always put the interest of our students first. And actually, what you really do is put the lie to the old canard that teaching and research are sometime, somehow at odds. Our students discover very quickly not only that teaching and research inform one another, but that they, near undergraduates, are encouraged to participate centrally in the research enterprise. At most institutions, it is unheard of for a graduating senior to have a CV that lists co-authorship or even authorship of an article or research note in a peer-reviewed journal, not at UNH. And what a research enterprise to participate in. Did you know that one of our colleagues, Larry Mayer, was just elected to the National Academy of Engineering? Larry is the first of our number to be so honored, but I suspect he will not be the last. And did you know that UNH continues to attract more than $100 million in competitive research grants annually? That is a tremendous feat in this era of reduced federal support for research. And among those $100 million is a $10 million federal grant that will help bring biomedical and bioengineering research to the marketplace even faster, where it will improve patient outcomes. Our research enterprise also encompasses a new bioengineering training center in Manchester to meet the demand for talent created by Army, the $300 million Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute led by Dean Kamen and funded by the U.S. Department of Defense that will help build a new human tissue engineering industry centered right here in New Hampshire. And as the hashtag MeToo movement put a national spotlight on sexual harassment and abuse, our own Prevention Innovations Research Center created a powerful new smartphone app that offers valuable support to survivors and that also helps prevent assaults in the first place. Today, the USAFE US app is available for free to college students across the country. Kudos to Pre Prevention Innovations. Again, I think every year I manage to uh, not to be able to avoid uh, shouting out to them. I'd also like to give a shout out to the E-Center. Sorry, a Marco Rubio moment. Um, which is a new cross-college effort that is giving 25 first-year students seed money, support, and resources to help them take their entrepreneurial ideas to market. And that seed money, by the way, all comes from private philanthropy from donors who believe so much in UNH that they happily open their wallets as well as their hearts to support our students. And on that score, at the end of June, we will close out the largest fundraising campaign in the history of UNH. When we started the quiet phase of the campaign for UNH nearly seven years ago, our outside campaign experts told us that we would be fortunate in light of the numbers in UNH's last campaign to raise maybe $150 million. If we wanted to stretch, and in their view, risk failure, we might, they said, shoot for a goal of $175 million. Well, we took on that challenge. And to date, more than 41,000 donors have joined in, including 55 who have given gifts of $1 million or more. And less than two weeks ago, at our foundation board meeting in Boston, I was able to announce new gifts totaling $8 million, all directed at scholarship support, by the way, including an additional $5 million from Dana Hamill, further to endow the Hamill Scholars Program, which helps keep New Hampshire's best and brightest in the state. And today, I am delighted to report that the campaign has not only surpassed its really, really, really stretch goal of $275 million that we announced at the public launch in 2016, but in fact has now crossed the $300 million mark. <clears throat> we still have four months to go 
So uh, everybody's got a chance still to, to pitch in a little bit more, and I'm sure we're gonna um, surprise ourselves even further by the end of June. I'd like to talk about one more important element of UNH's strength in 2018, and that is our renewed commitment to building a stronger, healthier campus climate. A campus climate that helps our students grow, not only as individuals, but as members of an engaged, diverse, equitable, civil, and safe campus community. Although UNH is overall an exceptionally warm and welcoming place, we have seen over the years some truly despicable acts of hate and racism in our midst. As you will recall, matters came to a head last spring in the wake of what has become an unacceptable annual excuse for drunken stupidity, the hijacked holiday of Cinco de Mayo. I have been inspired by how our entire community has since come together, students, faculty, staff, administrators, to take on these issues. For instance, since last spring, more than 1,500 employees have participated in diversity training. Some 1,300 students took part in our Safe Zones program. An additional 1,700 students engaged in training related to equity, inclusion, and community building. The Office for Multicultural Affairs also offered dialogues and training, especially for students on diversity-related topics that engaged nearly 1,000 students. And by the end of the summer, UNH will have in place a comprehensive plan on preventing interpersonal violence. Our shared commitment to building a better UNH reflects the true character of the UNH family. If you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to become involved with the Presidential Task Force on Campus Climate and with our Community Equity and Diversity Programs. Also, engage in the work that's taking place in your own college, department, classroom, or residence hall. This important work requires all of us to participate. We are all stakeholders. So, I would say that in sum, the state of the University of New Hampshire in 2018 is very strong indeed. But I can't leave the story there. Today's sunshine, and it really is shining out there, is no guarantee of fair weather tomorrow. In fact, to pursue that metaphor, no one involved in higher ed these days can be insensible to that subtle shift in atmospheric pressure, that prickling of the skin that foretells of storms to come. So while we rightly celebrate our strengths today, I want to take this last opportunity <clears throat> that I have to talk with you, at least in this sort of venue, to tell you about some of the things that I worry about as I contemplate tomorrow. There are four of them in particular that I want to mention. They are demographics, competition, cost structure and budget, and public attitudes toward higher education. Each of these represents a serious challenge. Although I'm an optimist at heart, I fear that meeting these challenges successfully will test every bit of our institutional metal. I hope that as a new president transitions into T Hall in the months ahead, you will work supportively with her or with him to take these challenges on aggressively. So let me start with demographics. New Hampshire, really all of New England, is graying. Actually, it's not just graying, it is the oldest and most rapidly aging of the Census Bureau's districts. Ten years ago, there were over 200,000 children in New Hampshire public schools, 200,000. Today, there are 180,000, it's a drop of 10%. The U.S. Department of Education projects that by 2025, enrollment will drop by more than another 20,000 in New Hampshire and it will continue dropping, at least through the early 2030s. That's a bleak predict projection, especially for higher education. The good news, one might counter, is that New Hampshire students graduate at a very high rate, the highest rate in the country, in fact. And that's true. And it's also true that many of them, around 75%, do go on to post-secondary education. The problem is they just don't do it here in New Hampshire. Nationally, about 18% of high school graduates, fewer than one in five, go out of state to college. New Hampshire's number is more than three times higher. Almost 60%, three out of every five of our high school graduates, go out of state to pursue their college education. And that's a number that hasn't changed as long as I've seen it measured. So that's the first big challenge. 
it's not a demographic cliff exactly, but it's a sort of demographic scree field, steeply pitched downward where it's sort of hard to find solid footing. The second big challenge is competition. Not only is the number of prospective students in our pipeline shrinking, but the number and variety of institutions competing for those dwindling few are expanding. Some of these are traditional four-year institutions, public and private. As the market shrinks, they are getting increasingly aggressive. As you probably know, UMass Lowell has for years offered in-state tuition to New Hampshire residents living within a 50-mile radius of Lowell. You've probably also heard that the University of Maine has become what they call, has begun what they call a flagship match program, enabling residents of nine different states, including California, New Jersey, and New Hampshire, who attend Maine to pay tuition at a rate capped at their own state's in-state rate. And I read just last week that the state system in Vermont is offering in-state tuition to residents of New Hampshire who live in a county that borders Vermont. Other institutions desperate to fill seats in their incoming classes have been offering tuition discounts of 70% and more. A tuition discount is money that an institution lops off the nominal tuition sticker price and gives back in financial aid. So a 50% discount rate, for instance, means giving back 50 cents on every dollar of tuition. While high discounting is a losing and arguably self-limiting strategy in the long term, in the meantime, it puts tremendous pressure on our own net tuition revenue models as we try to compete for those students. And it's not just traditional four-year institutions that should be of concern. Here are a few more to worry about. One is the wildfire-like growth of non-degree credentialing programs offered by a range of private and not-for-profit entities. Why bother going to college when for much less money and even less time, you can get a certificate in coding or networking or human resources, or so at least the logic goes. Another threat comes from foreign institutions. Until very recently, we were all pretty confident that international students would flock to U.S. universities, the best in the world. And they may still, especially when our visa and immigration debates resolve, as we all hope they will. But now we're seeing the acquisition of American campuses by foreign entities. The most recent that I'm aware of is right here in our own backyard. The campus of the now defunct Daniel Webster College in Nashua is apparently being acquired by Sun Yat-sen University, one of the 10 largest research universities in China. According to some reports, they plan to inject substantial capital and stand up competitive STEM programs, particularly in the biological sciences. A lot of folks in higher ed, myself included, believe that this is the beginning of a trend as struggling U.S. colleges either are acquired by foreign institutions or decide that it is in their interest to merge with such institutions. I'd also pay attention to the community colleges. New Hampshire has a fine set of two-year schools arrayed around the state. They all offer programs closely aligned with the region's workforce needs and with direct links to post-college employment and with tuition for full-time attendance set at less than half of ours. So even if New Hampshire doesn't go down the path of many other states and encourage community colleges to award four-year degrees, these institutions are attractive alternatives for many cash-strapped families that might otherwise consider UNH. And speaking of cash-strapped, let me talk for a minute about cost structures and budgets, which is my third and obviously related worry. This has been a financially challenging year for most of our operating units at UNH, academic and otherwise. In an effort to meet our university system board assigned operating margins, more on that in a second, we have asked unit heads to go slow on filling positions, to exercise restraint approving travel requests, and to be especially careful procuring supplies and services. This has created hardships, I know. Sadly though, pinched finances are not likely soon to go away. Our university, like all universities, has high fixed overhead. We operate and heat a vast number of buildings. We aim to pay everyone fair market-based ba rates and to offer competitive health and retirement benefits. Unfortunately, the revenue side of the ledger has a hard time keeping pace. 
As we all know, state support is low and has been flat at best for a long time. Philanthropy has been growing, as I mentioned, but the spinoff from our modest endowment contributes less than 3% of our operating budgets. Most of our revenue comes from student tuition and fees, and frankly, we are hitting a wall, both in terms of the market and in terms of what is right, given our public mission in looking to above inflation tuition increases to bail us out of budget jams. So, we have steadily rising costs and we have highly constrained revenues. Add to that the fact that we need to look increasingly to our own resources to fund capital projects. In the old days, even if the state of New Hampshire didn't offer much operating support to public higher education, they could be counted on for capital support, the big dollars necessary to renovate old buildings or put up new ones. The so-called KEEP initiatives that allowed us over a period of years to renovate or rebuild Kingsbury, Parsons, Demerit, and James Halls are the best example of the impact of generous capital infusions from the state of New Hampshire. The state provided, in fact, over $140 million for those four important projects. Well, that was then. In the past six years, the state provided $16 million across the entire university system. Of that amount, only $7.9 million, or less than a half, came to UNH. Let me repeat that. UNH received only $7.9 million from the state in the past six years for all of our building needs. The priority capital project we want Concord to help fund now is the renovation and expansion of Spalding Hall so that we can better meet the needs of the fast-growing bioscience sector. We will continue to advocate for this important project. And this is where the concept of operating margin is important. Every year, we need to save a little more money than we spend. We do this in part to be prudent and in part to satisfy bond rating agencies, but we do it especially because that is now the only sure way we have to generate enough money to undertake critical capital projects. That's how we renovated McConnell. That's how we renovated Ham Smith. That's how we're renovating Conant. For the past few years, our board mandated margin has been 3%. 3%. That is that we aim to spend 3% less than we take in. Generally, we've been able to meet or exceed that margin target without undue strain. This year, for some of the reasons I've already mentioned, it's been more of a struggle. And as I look out to fiscal year 19, 20, 21, and beyond, I don't see any signs of easing. It's not a crisis. As long as our enrollments remain strong, we should be able to hit those margin targets, but it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna be fun. And here's the last thing I'm worried about, or at least the last thing I'll depress you with today. Um, and that is that Americans as a whole have come to dislike and distrust higher education and all of those associated with it. Actually, that may be too tame a characterization. The front page of Newsweek a week or two ago had a banner headline that screamed, War on College, complete with a flaming mortar board. What the healthcare industry, doctors, hospitals, insurance, and pharmaceutical companies was to America in the 1980s and 1990s, seen as greedy, out of control, out of touch, tone-deaf elites, watching blithely as their near monopolies drove prices at two and three times the rate of inflation, higher education has become in the early 21st century, at least in the eyes of many Americans. This has taken many people inside the academy by surprise. For generations, higher education was a rock solid pillar of American life, valued, respected, even revered. Pick your metaphor, college was the golden ticket, the ladder to the middle class, the conveyor belt to a better life. We were never beyond criticism, of course. We were too focused on research and a little, too little focused on teaching, too detached, sometimes too inaccessible, and always at least a little too expensive. But higher education was always deemed essential by everybody. Everyone wanted for themselves and their children what colleges and universities alone could provide. And why not? We could wave charts that showed how much more income you could count on with a bachelor's degree, not to mention a master's, PhD, or professional degree, and point to data that demonstrated that college graduates lived longer and happier lives. 
I always used to say in public sessions with parents and prospective students, the only thing more expensive than a college education is not having one. And people believed until they didn't. For many years, the nonprofit, nonpartisan group Public Agenda has asked in their national poll the question, do you think a college education is essential to be successful in today's world of work? Year over year, the number of people saying yes increased, as one might suppose in an increasingly knowledge-based and sophisticated economy. In 2009, in fact, fully 55% of Americans were convinced that what we in higher education provide is essential to life success. Then in 2010, the number dropped. It dropped again in 2011, and in 2012, and in 2013, and in 2014, and in 2015, and until in 2016, it registered just 42%. That decline, by the way, was exactly coincident with a rise in the number of people answering yes to another one of the public agenda uh, organization's questions. There are many ways to succeed in today's world without a college education. 43% said yes to that in 2008, 57% said yes to that in 2016. And it's not just public agenda. Just a few months ago, the Pew Research Center found a sharp partisan divide in public attitudes. Nearly six out of every 10 Republicans and Republican-leaning independents in America believe higher education actually has a negative impact on the country. That's not skepticism or indifference, that's hostility. Now you might say, well, we can fix that by persuading people to make different choices in the voting booth. Maybe. I would suggest, though, that becoming a major target of partisan ire is a bad place, indeed an unsustainable place, for any institution to be. In any way, it's not just the right that is skeptical of higher education. The New America Foundation, hardly a bastion of conservatism, has been sharply critical of colleges and universities. They recently published a survey indicating that more than a third of Americans believe that colleges and universities put their own needs before those of their students. Kevin Carey, whom many of you have probably seen, their chief higher education analyst has charged the higher education establishment with systematically ignoring rising costs, resisting accountability, and obstructing efforts to create transparency. So the left may press for free college, but I assure you that if it comes, it will come with strings, and you're not gonna like those strings. So just to summarize, we have drastically fewer kids in our pipeline, those few remaining head in disproportionate numbers to other states, chased by an increasing number of competitors, leaving institutions like UNH scrambling to balance operating budgets and scratching to find a few dollars for capital investment, all in an environment largely bereft of friends and allies. Those are pretty serious challenges. The good news is I believe that we can meet them. And I do want to end this address on that positive note. I actually am optimistic about UNH's prospects despite all the clouds. Here's why. First, demography is not necessarily destiny, or at least the dismal de demography of the Northeast will not necessarily affect all institutions the same way. There is good evidence to believe that among the diminishing number of students looking for a relatively traditional four-year residential education, perceived institutional quality will play an increasingly determinative role. That is, institutions that are seen as offering real value will thrive. Those that are seen as marginal in quality will fail. UNH has a strong brand. We are not like many institutions suffering from a dearth of qualified applicants. In fact, applications for fall of 2018 are up across the board. Second, I actually view New Hampshire's historic export of college students as an opportunity. If we can nudge our numbers closer to the national average, admittedly difficult in a state as small as ours and as surrounded by high quality institutions, we can continue to increase our applicant pool measurably. Third, what I described as our strong brand is not just the product of marketing fog, We are rightly known for a strong and caring faculty and staff. We are known as a place that is big enough to be diverse and interesting, but small enough that no one needs feel lost. 
We're also known as the safest campus in the country and increasingly as a place that takes the bridge to the world of work beyond college as seriously as we take the work in college. And we're located in one of the most beautiful spots in the country, close to the ocean, mountains, lakes, and forests, as well as one of America's great cities. That's a lot to leverage. Fourth, while we are expensive relative to our public flagship peers in many other states, we're actually still a bargain compared to our private school counterparts, BU, BC, Bentley, the whole swath of small liberal arts colleges, which is really an apt comparison given, a qual given the quality of the UNH experience. That we have that price edge on that sector of our competition is a reflection of the fact that we have learned over the decades how to be extraordinarily resourceful and frugal. Other public universities have yet to learn those lessons, but they will be forced to soon, as there is no sign of disinvestment in public higher education slowing any time soon. And that'll give us an edge on those other public institutions. It takes time to learn to be frugal, and some are going to run out of time. Fifth, with very few exceptions, other public flagships have sought to staunch the bleeding caused by declining state support by enrolling ever larger numbers of international and out-of-state students to the exclusion of high-achieving, low-income resident students. This phenomenon is so widespread that the Jack Kent Cook Foundation recently issued a scathing report entitled State University No More, the essential charge of which was that public flagships have abandoned their central mission for a few additional pieces of silver. UNH has not done that. Not because we're necessarily more noble, although I do believe that we are all committed to the mission that we have to serve all qualified New Hampshire residents, but really because the demography perhaps perversely is in our favor. We can and do and always will admit and educate all qualified New Hampshire residents, regardless of income, in part because there are so few of them. When we admit kids from Massachusetts or California or China, we do so not at the expense of New Hampshire kids. This is an extraordinarily important fact to emphasize as we seek to counter what I earlier referenced, the war on college. These are all great assets. None of them works automatically, however. We need to continue to be smart and intentional to leverage them. Let me leave you with five suggestions as to how to do that. These are initiatives already underway. Thank you for the water. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. These are initiatives already underway to a greater or lesser extent. In fact, most have their roots in the strategic plan that we adopted back in 2010. But they are initiatives on which I think we should, as an institution, really double down. First, Deepen the ties between liberal arts and the professional programs, and between the learning that happens in our classrooms <clears throat> and the world of work. Although most of the drumbeat from public officials in recent years has been about STEM and coding and vocational skills, we know from employers that more than anything, what the world needs and wants are people who can think and write, engage in critical analysis, speak clearly, and work well on a team as well as deploy technical skills. It's not liberal arts versus pro professional education. It's both. And tweaks to our gen ed program are not going to get us there, by the way. We need to re-examine how we do undergraduate education from the ground up, outside the silos of disciplines as much as possible. And we need to connect that education to the world beyond UNH as purposefully and deliberately as possible. I would submit that efforts like Paul College's FIRE program need to go university-wide, and CAPS, the Career and Professional Success Initiative, should be fully supported and leveraged. Second, we need to plan for diversity in our student body, not just racial and ethnic diversity, although certainly that too, but diversity in age as well. I suspect that UNH will always, or at least for the foreseeable future, be a residential institution that primarily serves 18 to 21 year olds. We do, though, still need to recognize and embrace the fact that the need for continuing education for adults already in the workforce and unable or disinclined to move to Durham or Manchester or Concord is real. It's already here, and we are not really equipped to serve that population. 
we need to multiply exponentially the number and variety of short courses and certificate programs we offer and make them available in ways that fully serve the market. Our reorganized and re-energized professional development and training programs, now being led by Cooperative Extension, have been doing great work, but they need to be expanded and fully meshed with the work of all academic units. Third, and relatedly, we need to learn to flex. I know I sound like a broken record on this subject, but I believe it is critical that we rethink our calendar, our department structures, and our modes of instruction. In a world that is changing as fast as ours is changing, in an environment that offers prospective students as many choices from as many competitors as our environment offers, it is, in my view, nothing short of crazy to hold so fast, so tenaciously to place-based education in discipline-defined majors delivered in an academic calendar premised on the need for students to go home every summer to work on the farm. I know there are exceptions. I know that in some cases, professional accrediting bodies impose serious limits on what we can and can't do with our calendar and curriculum. But I think that if we were honest with ourselves and we thought about the student experience primarily from the student perspective, those exceptions aside, we would design structures and programs and timetables that looked a whole lot less like those that we and our advisors in graduate school grew up in and became comfortable with. Fourth, we need to fix our budget and financial management system. RCM is great in many respects. It puts budget authority squarely in the hands of line managers where it belongs, and I would never ever advocate going back to a centralized budget model. But there are three flaws in the system that we have designed. First, interdisciplinary efforts, efforts that by definition require cooperation and coordination across RC units, are far, far harder than they should be. And that is a perilous flaw in a rapidly changing environment. Second, the current flow of dollars to decentralized RC units provides very few central strategic funds. While there are a lot of old jokes out there about universities being nothing more than disconnected departments held together solely by complaints over parking, the truth is, uh, that, that was the former chancellor of the UC system, by the way, the truth is that it's hard to steer the ship and make the investments that benefit the entire institution without some strategic funds deployable from the center. I suspect the new president will come quickly to the same conclusion. I expect he or she will come to the same conclusion about a third issue with our financial management system as well. And that is that it really hasn't evolved much beyond a set of occasionally updated spreadsheets. Because our central budget office runs on a fuel mixture at least as lean as everyone else's at UNH, we have not been able to make the investments necessary in a truly modern information system. So for instance, while we have a pretty good estimate of where we are today, February 20th, vis-a-vis -vis our fiscal year 18 margin target of 3%, we really don't know with a sort of certainty or exactitude that an organization of our size and sophistication should. More investments need to be made in this area if we're going to weather the challenges ahead. We've chipped away at some of these issues, but we really have not fully resolved them. My final suggestion is this. UNH should market, 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 and then market some more. I know this is apostasy to some <clears throat> who believe that as long as we deliver quality, the world will automatically know it and beat a path to our door. I wish that were true. But in fact, in this increasingly competitive environment where we are regularly outspent in recruitment and marketing by our competitors, it is essential that we be active and smart and deliberate in getting the word out and all the various media available about UNH, about what we have to offer, our impact on the state and nation, what a value we are. Even if we have to look for loose change under the sofa cushions, we need to boost our marketing budget. So I leave you with that today. UNH is in great shape, but there are unprecedented challenges on the horizon, challenges that are sure to rock the foundations of higher education. I am confident that UNH, unlike many American colleges and universities, will not only survive these challenges, but will thrive in the face of them. We have the resources, the ingenuity, and the native ability. Perhaps the greatest of our resources is the deep affection that we all have for this wonderful place. 
Change is hard. Sometimes it's even painful. But when we know that change is essential to sustain someone or something that we love, we'll always summon the gumption to make the change. So I want to thank you for the support you've given me as I've sought to steward this place for the last 11 years. And I want to thank you in advance for the support I know you will give to whoever follows. I'll be leaving Durham in three months, but wherever I am, I'll always be a wildcat. Thank you.